Hello, my dear parents and friends. A very good day to you wherever you are watching us from. And we are so happy to come to you once again. Today we are going to talk about some very interesting things. And I have um, with me one of the foremost occupational therapists in Ghana. Um, she's Mildred. I'm going to give her a chance to talk very soon. Just before that, let me just share to my friends. So if you just join us, you can also share to your um, friends on Facebook and you can tag them so they come to watch. So let me just take a minute and do that before we proceed. So um, I have just shared to my um, my Facebook so that my friends can watch as well. And when you do that, tag someone, tag your friend's teacher because you are going to talk about your, your kid's teacher because you are going to talk about some things that are very um, relevant to our kids in school as well as in their homes. And uh, I see someone has joined us, so we will quickly just go on. Mildred, can you please introduce yourself to our audience? Okay, good afternoon everyone. My name is Mildred Redu. I am an occupational therapist. Um, I'm currently working in mental health in Ghana and I have experience working with children who have special needs in a, an inclusive school. So it's good to be on this broadcast. Thank you so much. And um, just from um, the kind of exposures that we have. A lot of us may not know what an occupational therapist does. So can okay. you just tell us what an occupational therapist does, especially as related to the development of children? Okay. Um, so occupational therapy, usually um, it takes a long time to explain, but because we don't have much time, I'm just going to make it as simple as possible. We look at, or we, we can say that occupational therapists are equipped with um, the skill to be able to help where there is a dysfunction. So it can be functional dysfunction of any sort, okay? So it doesn't matter whether, that, whether the person has a diagnosis or not. If you are struggling with education, if you are struggling to play, if you are struggling meeting up, uh, milestones or if you're I mean when I say meeting up milestones it means um, growing at a developmental level expected of you then you might need the assistance of an occupational therapist um, so most people that have occupational therapy deficits or I will say that have um, functional deficits and may need occupational therapy may present with physical issues, they could um, have mental issues, they could um, have behavioral issues that um, may result to them being maybe called special needs kids or maybe having some form of disability. So with children, that is what occupational therapists do. You look at the effect on education, effect on play, effect on growth, effect on um, social interaction. So if at any point a parent feels like my child seems a bit different or my child is not meeting up the requirement expected, then um, occupational therapy will be your call to get assessed and then get treatment. I hope I have understood. You said, um, you said occupational therapists come in to make a child play, to make a child achieve in education and to yes, make a child grow. Yes. basically that is what it is. So if your child has yes, some yes. behavioral issues, if you just think that your child may be different, it's good to have okay. your child assessed. So today we want to talk about the toys and equipment that are available to our children and how uh, they impact on their development. Um, mm -hmm. Let me just say to my viewers that when I started talking with Mildred about this show, I said how toys can hinder development. Then she said, no, 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 no. She didn't want to say that any toy was bad. <laughs> Every toy is good. But it depends on how your child uses the toy or the equipment. So mm -hmm. can we start off 
and we take one equipment or a toy that is available to our children and starts to talk about how we can use it to the to give the child an advantage and how the child can use it and it puts him or her at a disadvantage. Okay, thank you very much. So I will um, start slowly. Let me just start with something as simple as a pacifier. And um, a lot of people just use pacifiers. Um, you put it in a child's mouth when the child is crying so that the child will be pacified or comforted or the child will be quiet for some time. And it has a similarity to the nipple or to um, a feeding bottle. So it stays in there. And because one of the things that a child picks up early or the child is almost um, born with is the ability to suck. So it's one of the few toys that are introduced to um, the kids. Um, and it's becoming very, very um, popular. So the pacifier so will be a good start. Describe, let me just take a second to describe what a pacifier is. A, a lot of us okay. would know it. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. we couldn't bring you pictures, but like she described, it is that thing that looks like a nipple that we can put in the mouth of a baby. And um, mm -hmm. usually you see them um, when you have uh, people who are a bit small, say middle class or upper class, when they are holding their mm -hmm. children, then there's a pacifier in their mouth. So it looks like the end or the teeth of a feeding bottle and then they put it in the child's mouth. I, I hope everybody gets what a pacifier is. And greetings <laughs> from Kofi George to you, Mildred. Oh, hello. <laughs> okay, thank you. So I want to say that a pacifier is very good, especially to keep a child quiet. I think that's what parents go for it. Uh, that's the main reason why parents go for it. Let me keep the child quiet. Let me also be able to keep the baby away so that I can have my rest. Maybe, uh, most of the time when a child is sucking on that pacifier, they are quiet because it also provides a lot of comfort for the child. And then I can say that it helps the child to sleep much longer than the child would without a pacifier. But um, with acquisition of all these kind of toys, I don't want you to look at one side only. You must look at one, um, the pros, which are the advantages, and then you must also look at the cons, which are the disadvantages. I would say that I wouldn't necessarily call these disadvantages. I would say have a look out. Um, when you are buying a pacifier for your kid. The first thing is the fact that a lot of kids have um, had instances where they choke on the pacifiers because the parents tend to go and do something else or en engage or um, engage in other activities when the, um, the, the child is in that calming state. Uh, and there are instances when the child would choke on it and it could be dangerous, especially for infants and the very young ones. And so when you are buying it, at least make sure that the base or the bottom is, it should be at least 1.5 inches. Okay. So that you are, you have done your part in ensuring that the child is safe so that the child will not choke. And then um, one thing also that the pacifier can do that I have observed is the fact that it brings about what we call nipple confusion. And I'm going to explain that in a minute. So, so the nipple Jackson, confusion, you said, that the, you said that the pacifier should be about 1.5 inches, but for a lot of us, the base of it, the base of it. Yes, yes, please. A lot of us cannot think in inches. So um, how mm -hmm. can you relate the size of the mouth of the baby? Okay. Um, I think a parent's thumb could be a rule of, um, a rule for measurement. Just make sure that the base is at least the size of your thumb from the tip to the bottom of your thumb. Uh, where's my thumb? Yeah. Please, can you see my thumb? Yes. So can you can do from there to the bottom. Okay, okay. So that's okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so then you know that you. it's big enough not to go inside, I mean, the base of it, because obviously we want the tip to go inside the child's mouth, but the base should be big enough to block 
the child's mouth so that it doesn't go further down, especially in awkward positioning. And we have to be very careful when the pacifier is in the child's mouth. Watch the position that you place the child. The child can't be down like that. And then there's a pacifier. And if the child is struggling to breathe, it will be difficult um, for the child. So rather use positions that are better, like try to sit the child upright or a, um, a little bit propped up. At least the head should be a bit elevated so that we know that the child is safe, especially for the very young babies. So um, another thing that pacifiers tend to do that we don't look at is the fact that it gathers a lot of germs. <laughs> it can pick up a lot of germs and some of them, especially the fancy ones, have parts that are not easy to clean. And we must understand that the babies don't have a strong an immune system um, to be able to fight off some of the, let's say, basic everyday germs. So when you are having a pacifier, at least pay attention to it like you would do with a baby's bottle part. If you need to boil it together with those things that you boil to sterilize, if you have a sterilizer, make sure that also goes in because it gathers a lot of germs and most of the time, because it goes straight into the mouth, I mean, it's like if the germs are on, there's no two, uh, two ways about it, it's going, it's going down. And I mentioned the nipple confusion and that has to do, please, may I continue? Continue. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, that has to do with because of the similarity of the feel and the look and the touch of, of, of the nipple and the pacifier. It's actually a preferred way <laughs> of getting food in for the children. It's much easier. You know, it's, it's, it's so much like the tip of a feeding bottle. So you just put it in your mouth and then you have the comfort that you need. So the children that have not learned to suckle well enough, if you introduce the pacifier too early, they might not want to suckle. And I mean, they might not want to suck the breast milk like they should, because that technique of sucking the breast milk is a little bit more complicated than um, just putting the pacifier in or drinking from the bottle of the um, feeding bottle, I mean. So and this, then, issue um, confusion, this nipple of nipple confusion, is, mm -hmm. it's, it, sounds, um, um, a bit, um, it sounds a bit strange to a lot of us, because I remember on my channel, I did a video on nipple confusion, and when mm -hmm. I released it, I put it in a women's group and people actually came out and told me that I was telling lies. <laughs> so I don't know about, about nipple confusion, but nipple confusion mm -hmm. is there. Nipple confusion is basically that your baby is confused between what is a pacifier, what is a mm -hmm. breast nipple, and what is mm -hmm. a bottle nipple. And when a baby has nipple confusion, that can actually make you stop breastfeeding before yeah. you are ready to breastfeeding before mm. your baby is six months old. So nipple confusion is real. I have personally seen it in my practice as a pediatrician. Mm -hmm. um, but because um, this awareness is not there, um, a lot of people don't know about it, don't mm. even believe it. But, but it is there and it is real. And one of the it things is. you should do to make your breastfeeding journey a successful one is to delay the introduction of a pacifier. If you are going to introduce it, you should delay it until your baby is conversant with breastfeeding and until you yourself are also conversant with breastfeeding. Because usually for us first-time mothers, it takes a while for the mother to get used to breastfeeding and the baby as well. The position and everything mm -hmm. is tricky. So you should delay the introduction of a pacifier until both you and your baby are conversant. Um, mm -hmm. I have an age in mind to give you, but I don't want Mildred to say that <laughs> what I'm saying is not true. So I won't give an age. I will just oh. say that babies, men are different. <laughs> Make sure your baby is conversant before you introduce yeah. a pacifier. So I'm very happy that you have brought this today. So those <laughs> who told me that there was nothing for little confusion, just oh. realize that it's pediatricians who say it, the occupational therapists also say it. It's also saying it. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs>
<laughs> All right. Thank and you. Hi to Papo, Aram, Linda, and Godfrey. Thank you for joining us today. Oh, thank you. Hello. <laughs> okay. So, um, another thing. Let me just add one more thing. Um, with a pacifier, it's very um, it's very comforting, very easy to use. So. Even when the time comes for the child to stop using the pacifier, sometimes it becomes a bit of a challenge. So when you take the pacifier away, they will go um, for thumb sucking. So you take the pacifier away, the easy thing to put in the mouth is the, the thumb. So it's also a way of encouraging the child to thumb suck. And we know the um, difficulties that come with thumb sucking. If you put your fingers in your mouth for a long time, prolonged um, thumb sucking can, can lead to a couple of dental issues even. The child is possibly going to develop an overbite, you know, because the thumb, um, the thumb being in is also guiding how the teeth should develop and how the dental arrangements um, should be so it can have an effect not a very big effect but it can have some effect and so i think that's about it with a pacifier thank you the floor is yours so you can go on and tell us we are really enjoying it we have so many people on on youtube on linkedin as well watching us <laughs> we'll go ahead <laughs> All right, I'm just going to move in. So that means that um, questions can come later. Questions um, can actually come at any time. So that's to my okay. viewers. You can put your questions at any time. We will pause and um, answer them as they come in. All right, thank you. So my next favorite thing or equipment to talk about when it comes to do's and don'ts for... Um, child equipment will be the walker and i i don't have pictures maybe dr seram can explain further but a walker is um that car with wheels that you put a child in when the child is about to walk uh -huh. uh, please could you explain it further for the viewers to understand since we don't that, have pictures to show I mean that's just what a walker is. Traditionally, it's made of wood and then it has these mm -hmm. wheels and then the child is able to, it has a long bar handle. So the child holds both mm -hmm. ends of it. So a long mm -hmm. bar handle has pended down and with tires or something that it can move on. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's mm -hmm. no tires, it's just the piece of wood. So that's a walker. <laughs> we, we give it mm -hmm. to our children to hold on to when they are standing and to help mm -hmm. them to move help them to take mm -hmm. their steps at least that is what is in our mind we think we are helping mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. okay so um let me start with a positive aspect of it because um when a parent puts a child in in a walker most of the time it's a hands-free period for the parents, especially for the mother or the primary caregiver, to be able to get to do other things. And then, you know, when a child is engaged or busy playing with the walker, then the mother has other things that she could attend to. So it's like, um, it's a free time. And then also, we hear that it helps the child to learn how to walk. We will discuss that, uh, all right? Um, also, parents seem to like it because it's also a way of getting the baby who usually spends most of the time um, lower or in a plane that is on the ground to almost like come up and be upright and look like mom and dad. So it's also a very, um, it's like a big step for the baby now to be upright like mom and dad because they've got something to hold on. And then when it moves, they also step and step. So it's like, I can walk like mom and dad. So I'm looking at those as uh, advantages, but let's just dive in and talk about why I don't like walkers so much. <laughs> All right. It is presumed that the walkers help with, um, practicing standing and for practicing walking. I, 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 I disagree. I don't think that the walker is ideal for helping a child to walk. 
And let me explain that. Most of the time, because of the wheels, and you look at the child's age and how much steps are expected of them in the beginning stages, it just moves too fast. There is little control um, of the wheels in the walker, and then um, it means that the child can tip off at any time. The child can fall for the local ones, and then also for, for the um, foreign ones that we know, the, the ones that the child is inside, it's like the child is trapped in there. And the legs are moving whichever way that the walker is moving them. They don't have as much control over the device. So it's more like the equipment is controlling the child and not a child controlling the um, equipment. So I would say that if you ever think of buying a walker, think twice about it. There has been bans on walkers in some countries of the world. Um, I, in Ghana or in West Africa, there aren't much countries that have banned walkers, especially in Ghana, anyone can still use walkers. But if something is being banned in other countries, then you must understand that it's actually quite dangerous. Mm -hmm. there is a, it's led to a lot of injuries for children and it's led to even death. When a child who is in a walker tips over or falls down, most of the injuries are around the head and the neck. These are very, very dangerous in injuries. They sustain fractures. Some just can't make it and they die. Sometimes the upper extremities, you know, I mean, the arms also get into injuries, things like um, accidents from hot liquids, um, accidents from, from electrical gadgets, because when the child is up like that and they don't need to control anything but just move as, as um, the wheel guides and direct them, they, they move uh, um, towards things that may potentially be dangerous. And we must understand that at that age, um, you know, before one, the kids don't have that much judgment to say that, oh, I'm not supposed to pull on this electrical wire or I'm not supposed to go near this um, furniture and pull it down. It could potentially fall down on me. They don't know that. So you don't leave a child in a walker and for the child to just move around and explore and touch. It's very, very dangerous, especially with houses that have, um stories you know if if the house is a story building and there are staircases it, it causes a lot of damage some kids just tumble downstairs and break their necks most don't survive i would say that if ever you will you will um use a worker for your child don't take that as a free time they must be watched closely and then there are other things also in terms of the, the um, let me say, when you put the child in a walker, there is a net. I don't know if, if some of you have seen the walker, obviously, because I'm sure there are mothers here. Um, the walker has a net with holes for the legs to enter. And then for those ones, sometimes you realize that the length of 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 the um, child basically the child gets suspended <laughs> yes the child gets suspended and then sometimes the tips of their of their foot um tend to touch the ground and then they use the tip to walk and that eventually can lead to um structural damages or um difficulties later on with a child they will tend to toe walk or tiptoe when they walk later on in life. You must try to avoid that as much as possible. And also when they are suspended, there are damages that go on around the child's hips. So we must always be sure I would, if I ever would use anything close to a walker, I would choose the one that has adjustable height. Make sure that your child's foot is flat on the ground at least to prevent that aspect of tiptoeing or toe walking later on in life, make sure that the foot is flat on the ground, okay? And then the hands are also free to move on the plate of the walker. Um, a better alternative to, will be just go for 
um, you know, these activity centers or these um, tables that have um, simple activities that are stuck on them, that a child can stand and play on top. Because that is more ideal. When they say the child is practicing walking in the walker, that is not working. Before you walk, you need to find your standing balance. And most kids that are put in the walker don't even have the standing balance to move on to, you know, step out of balance and try to keep themselves up. So in the long run, you realize that the children that didn't even go in the walkers learn how to walk faster than those who are in the walker. Because they are not Thank actively you, doing very, anything. Very much, Mildred. Thank you so much, Mildred. A lot of people are reacting to this walk a bit. I know why they are <laughs> reacting because, I mean, um, traditionally, <laughs> our mothers thought they needed to help us to walk. But a, a walker mm. is, is just not the way. I, I would say it's a, it, a walker is not the way. The first reason being that children are of different lengths or height, mm -hmm. you know, but at that age, we call them length. Children are of different lengths. The walker that the carpenter makes is made as a one-size-fits-all. And if you have a long child or a, a, a short child or a tall child, then they, there's already a problem. Children get suspended. They are, their toes are, it's like they are being forced to learn to walk on their toes. And like mm -hmm. she also said, walkers lead to so many injuries and children are so fragile. A child breaks the neck. It's not the same as when an adult has an injury. You know, their bones are so brittle, still developing. So walkers do not really help our children to, to walk. And she gave an alternative, an activity set where the child can stand. You know, we want our children to cruise, to hold something and move around, but not put them in the walker. And it's like the walker is the one directing the child. Not that the child is directing the walker, and we don't want that. Hello mm -hmm. to Auntie Emma who has joined us. Auntie Emma has also joined us. Canadino, they are all, um, they are all, I, I think this is one of my favorite <laughs> children as well. So it's not just them. Thank you so much. All right. Um, there's a question that I want to um, quickly answer. She said she joined late and she was asking about, that is Yvonne. She was asking about the pacifier. Is it a do? or a don't. And uh, <laughs> I, I think um, our occupational therapist said that if you are buying the pacifier, make sure it is one that the base will not disappear into the child's mouth. So it should be as big, the base should be as wide as the length of your thumb. And then even though they can calm your child and give you some time, peace of mind to do other things, know that the pacifier can lead to um, nipple confusion, which we explained, the pacifier can come, there, there can be germs on the pacifier that your child is swallowing if you don't treat it well. So it's not necessarily that there are germs because if you treat it the way you treat a feeding bottle, that is by boiling it or sterilizing it. Sterilizing. Then it's kind of, yes, and um, some children become so dependent on the pacifier that when you take the pacifier off, um, they can be thumb suckers, but pacifiers have a role. There are some children that have difficulties learning to suck, and mm -hmm. pacifiers can be used to help them to learn how to suck. So it's not, there are many disadvantages, but it's also useful when, when the situation requires it. So you have to look at it and decide what you yeah. want to do for your child. And uh, let me see if there's another question before I let you move on to your next one. Um, so Wisdom says that they were thinking about buying a walker, but now <laughs> they are changing their minds. <laughs> so hi from Afi and Empress, and Yvonne is okay. thanking us for the explanation. All right, let's move on. I'm really, really enjoying this one. Oh. <laughs> Okay, okay. Um, let me just add uh, one more. Let me just add one more um, with, with the walker. So when a child is in the walker, what could potentially happen is that the child, especially the walker that you go inside, the child doesn't see their lower body. And you can't trade gait or you can't train somebody to walk without them seeing how their lower body is moving. So essentially, you are not training the child on how to walk. You have just let, uh, left the child 
in an equipment and the equipment seemingly looks like your child is walking because it will move and your child's legs are going to move but that is not um functional walking of any sort so that's also another um bad side i wouldn't say don't go and buy your walker but before you buy the walker think about all these things and decide <laughs> um may i move on to the next one sure all right this is also another famous one and it is the tablet um in this technological age almost every child that i come across in my practice as as young as age one they have their tablets or they have an iphone or they have a gadget that is almost like a necessity like the child needs it to pay attention the child needs it to be quiet the child needs it to keep the fingers working but um even though everyone is getting a tablet i think most people haven't um, been informed of um all the things that a tablet could do for a child and then um, since i've started um always mentioning the good sides let me say that the good thing about a tablet is the fact that you know um parents enjoy seeing the child use a tablet and it's it's some form of a pride like oh if the child can navigate this gadget so well then my child is so so intelligent you know and then parents also see it as 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 fashionable you know it comes with the age for every child like to have something that shows that you are living um in the technological age and you are not left back in the stone age so that's another thing and then also of course it keeps the child busy tablets seem to keep the child busy for long hours and parents can be free go and make their phone calls some parents can even get out of their houses without their children noticing and to parents this is a good thing because we all want to have our lives back after we have children right <laughs> okay but um unfortunately i'm just going to bust your bubble here and say that all those things um it may seem fashionable it may seem nice but for me if you ever introduce a tablet to your child especially for um long exposures or for long sets of time long periods of time to the extent that the child cannot let go of the tablet then i am sorry but you are doing the child more wrong than good and i want us to discuss a few of those things the first part is the addiction you know, there are people on the show who are crying because of hey. this. <laughs> me <laughs> this one you are here we are sorry but we just want to tell you what is real what can help all of us <laughs> Oh, all right um pardon me okay i would just i would try to be as sensitive as possible i mean i am a mother myself and i've had that dilemma of going for a tablet so that i could just rest you know i could take that long yeah. nap i could get that beauty sleep but you know the things that i've had to think about i just want you to also think about okay um The tablets can be quite addictive that's the first one and then there's so you see there's a pattern of almost all the um toddlers that use tablets that you can see they feel entitled to this gadget it's almost like it's a it's a lifeline if you take it from them it's is the worst punishment ever people kids have had to throw tantrums at social events and at public places just because um the mother decided to give the tablet a, a break from the child and you can see that that is not good enough for a child that young to be um to feel that form of addiction to a device you know 
those are the times when you want your children to more like bond with you and feel the attachment with you. But you realize that when the kids feel that attachment and a bonding uh, with the device, they tend to forget their parents. The mother walks in, walks out, they don't notice. Anything just happens, but just, you know, you can take everything away, but give me my tablet. I will be fine. And I don't think that is good for the child's growth and development. Um, the thing is, with these smart devices, they have a way of affecting or changing some um, brain electromagnetic waves. There are some, you know, there are some chemicals that go on that, that are in the brain. I don't know. I'm trying to use simpler ways of explaining it, but your brain activity could be affected by prolonged use of these devices. And we must understand that children, even if children up to like age five, their brains are still developing. The brain is one of the organs that still keep developing after the baby is out of the womb. So you have to make sure that you nurture the information that goes in the brain, the kind of um, chemical activity that's happening at the level of the brain, and the prolonged exposure to this repetitive um, flashing of lights and screens changing constantly can have a negative effect on your child. And some of the negative effects um, could come in the form of attention. And then I've had, I, I've had um, times when people who come to see me say, I don't, I don't understand my child's teacher. My, child, my child's teacher says he can't pay attention, but he really pays attention with the gadgets. I mean, he can sit for like three hours, four hours paying attention on the, um, on the tablet or on the phone. And I want you to understand everyone here that that kind of attention is not attention. Actually, the brain is not resting at the time when the child is busy on um, the gadget. The a, a constant, you know, these devices are made also for commercial purposes. They have to be able to keep you um, watching so that you buy more. So. Most of the time, they, they, they have very high contrast, very sharp lights. They're constantly changing screens to keep you watching. So they, you would think my child is not moving and sitting still, but the brain is constantly working. Every second, something is changing. Things are happening. Um, objects are moving up and down the whole time. And then the child is watching in close proximity or how should I say, the child is very close, uh, you know, with the device, all the lights coming in, the child's um, circle of activity is just around here. Anything outside is like, it doesn't bother them. These children tend to have mood issues as, as well. And we've recorded irritability as well. You could see that the children that spend a lot of time with um, the tablets and the gadgets seem to be very irritable. And some of the mood issues could be improved on if we reduce the length of time that the children are being exposed to the gadgets. And then we can see that apart from mood and apart from um, concentration or attention, um, there's also learning. Some kids uh, have difficulties learning things like building language, things like generalizing what they are seeing on the screen to the natural world. Most of the kids that stay long um, on tablets and on iPhones and on other um, gadgets of that sort, you realize that creativity is very, very low. All they know is the monotonous activity of either finger clicking you know, while staring at a screen for long hours or, you know, swiping. And that is not enough. You have, you have so much you could do with your fingers. And all those times where you are glued and you are just swiping and poking, you are depriving the child from exploring the other aspects of the environment that they need to learn from. You know, the world is big and you can't limit your child to a gadget. And most of the things that are on the tablet, are, it's like a, there's a programming, you know, and uh, the, most of, it, um, of, the, of the programs are predictable and it's, it's like you cannot make any changes. 
so the child can um, finds it difficult to explore some aspect of their brain in logical yeah. thinking yeah. you know yeah. and yeah. yes so, so, let, so me come in here. let me come in here and um right. and just break break your flow a bit um <laughs> <laughs> there's there's actually a dialogue happening in the comment mm -hmm. section so okay you can tell us right now where are you watching us from and do your kids have tablets a child okay. has started she says her kids don't have tablets neither do mine my kids don't have tablets and my I've kids don't have tablets yes. mildred's don't either and and mildred how do they perform in school are they doing well yes they are how doing do they well do Yes, they're doing well. So your kids don't need a tablet to perform well in school. They don't need a tablet to be first in class. And being first in class does not even matter. What matters is, are your kids doing well? So my kids mm. don't have the tablets. And one of the reasons why they don't have tablets is that long ago, when I was in medical school, I came upon the recommendation that, um, according to the American Academy of Pediatrics, screen time was not allowed for children less than two years. So screen time is anything that you watch on a screen, tablets, phone, TV, mm -hmm. video game. Yes, now with COVID, the recommendations have been amended a little because with COVID came online learning and all those things. But think about it. These recommendations got amended because of COVID. They didn't get amended because um. I mean, it, it, it became better for kids to have screen time. So my kids don't have a tablet. And um, Taste and Bloom from Kumasi says that her boys don't have tablets initially too. Init they don't have tablets too. And uh, they wanted to get them for their kids, but then they changed their mind. So that's a good one. If your kids don't have tablets, seriously speaking, you are doing something right. Of course, there is the downside. The downside is that um, at an age, they may meet some of their peers who are able to do who don't find computers strange. So I would say that it's even better to get a desktop for your home than to have your child have a tablet. And that's desktop. Now there are um, softwares or applications that you can put on it to control what your children are, are mm -hmm. seeing and viewing. And now the recommendation says that they can have up to two hours of high quality program. High quality programs are programs that teach morals, programs that teach how you can interact with other children. But if you're always looking into a screen, how are you going to learn to interact with other children, you know? So up to two hours a week of high quality programming is allowed for children who are above two years. But again, how do you learn to interact with children, with other children, if your face is always in a screen? So tell us now if, um, so Albert is asking, um, I should ask you if watching of cartoons by children can also affect them negatively. I think I've answered it in the past, but I will let you talk more about it. Watching cartoons, that they affect yes, children negatively. Yes, yes. <laughs> oh, so I think you can let your child watch cartoons. So like Dr. Sayram was saying, it's about how much, you know, and the amount of control that a child has over the screen. If it's like cartoons that's lasting for 30 minutes, I mean, why not? If it's giving the child a break from an activity you've been doing, we are not banning screen time altogether, but we are saying that um, the take home message is that supervise, control, limit, avoid um, dependence, all those kind of things. And generalized concept that the child is learning to the real life so that the child can make it more educational as possible. So watching cartoons is not necessarily bad. Just watch, um, control how much time, if the child is sitting and watching cartoons for four hours, then I mean, obviously it's very bad. Thank you for your response. And Aisha is also saying that um, the discussion is very insightful. And frankly, this discussion has been um, better than I envisaged. And then we still want you to tell us about tablets because it's so common. And we want to know whether your kids have tablets or not and where you are from, first of all, whether your kids have tablets or not and tell us the reason why. So with, with cartoons, I've had a lot of clients come and then they say that, their child doesn't speak, but their child can recite all the rhymes in the cartoons or all the. <laughs> so, 
if you let the cartoon be the center of your child's life, then it is bad. Because how is the child going to learn that when I step on someone, I need to say sorry? I mean, okay, if the child can see it on the screen, all right. But in real life, how is the child going to learn if I step on someone, it pains the person? How is the child going to learn that if I say thank you to someone, it makes them happy? You know, we deprive them of the chance to learn so many things when all their attention is focused on one activity, whether it is cartoons or whatever it is. Yeah. So um, that's, that's the answer to the cartoons question. Um, somebody says the tablet part is hitting him hard. <laughs> I thought I'm doing my children good by buying them tablets, but hmm, that's what he says. <laughs> ah, interesting. Um, that's, that's actually why we, we, we are doing this, because we want to raise awareness um, about these things. So a lot of us do these things because we don't have the information that we should have. So that's why we are doing this. So let me just say that just like you have been surprised, someone else may be surprised. So kindly share for us because if you don't share, then we do not make the impact that we want to make. Um, my kids do not have tablets. I was contemplating buying some for them. Oh, have I got this? No, the same, a different person, Lily, actually. I was contemplating buying some for them, but I have changed my mind. Thank you, doctors, for this. We thank you for watching and listening. Kindly share for us. Um, the amended recommendation for under two is only when they are on a video call. All the kids should have an equal... Uh, playtime as watching TV. Even with the screen times, it should have at intervals 20 to 30 minutes at a time. So Aisha is correcting me about what I said about um, the recommendations. I mentioned that um, under two are not supposed to have screen time. Was We're not supposed to have screen time, but the recommendations have been amended now. And she's saying that the amended recommendation says that children should have screen time if they are less than two years, only when they are on a video call. Because the video call is an interaction with someone. They see the person change the person's facial expression. They respond mm -hmm. to what the person is saying. So it's more or less like interacting with the person actually, rather than interacting with someone you won't see or you won't know. The person cannot take feedback from you, but in a video call, you are getting feedback from the person, the person is getting feedback from you. Mm -hmm. And older kids should have an equal play time as watching TV. So if your child watches TV, <laughs> <laughs> one hour. Your child must play one hour. And uh, she says that even then, it should be 20 to 30 minutes apart. So your child should not watch TV for an hour or two hours. Your child should watch TV for, say, 30 minutes and then take a break and go and play or do something else. So there are all these things about screen time. And um, you have mentioned they become irritable. They have mood problems. in social situations. Oh, and uh, so thank you so much. I think there are new comments coming in. Um, let me see um, what we can take before we go because our time is almost up. All right. And Rita, hello to you. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate your time. So do you have any final comments. And let me just say that based on the response from this video, I'm definitely going to bring you again. But do you have <laughs> any comments for us before we go? Um, okay, so to sum everything up, I would say that there isn't any gadget that was just made or any toy that was made to destroy your child. They always have good intentions, but we must understand that the makers of the equipment that come have a commercial need as much as um, the other ways of helping society evolve. But you as a parent, the onus is on you to take the responsibility to follow, um, to, to do some form of research, to understand the pros and cons of devices before you go ahead and purchase them. Don't just buy it because it's a trend and everyone else is buying that toy or that equipment. So go home so message. One, one second, let me take this comment. Let me take this question. Um, can right. watching cartoons speed 
or help a child speak early when they are having speech delay. So a child who is having speech delay, can watching cartoons help them speak? So what happens is that most of the time you hear parents that are saying that, oh, this cartoon is teaching my child to say this and say that. And the kids, even the, the kids that are on the spectrum um, that may be autistic may have um, language delays. And then you hear the parents saying, oh, he's saying the same thing. He's repeating words after you. That is what we call echolalia so they are just saying the words but most of the time understanding doesn't come with it so they are just repeating what they hear and it may come across as the child learning to speak or improving on language but it's not like that it's actually just um giving the child opportunity to repeat but what is language or communication if we don't understand what we are saying Please think about so that. Let me, take, let me take this other question because um, we're just running out of time. Um, I okay. work with kids. Since kids under two years should not be allowed screen time, what are some mm. recommended activities for them? I, I think this question is very important. And if you are a mm. nursery teacher on this call, listen very mm. carefully. We don't want to send our children to school and they just watch TV from morning till evening. So Mildred, please tell us some of the activities. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much for that question. So I want you to, I want first to say that what I say here is not the only thing that you can do with your child. So first and foremost, let the teachers get some training on what to do with the children. There's a variety of things that can be done for children and um, under two, um, beside the screen time. First of all, let them engage with one another, singing. You know, singing and dancing, um, you know, it stimulates um, the, the vestibular system or the hearing, different uh, sounds that they hear can help the children grow and under, understand things like different pitches, different volumes. If, they, if, if this madame says this in this tone, then it means that the, the madame is angry. If she says it the same thing in that tone, maybe it could be a joke or, you know, so explore different sounds sing, tell stories, display pictures and, and, you know, pretend play, have fun with the children. I want you to also, the visual stimulation, you can have other ways, you know, the things that they can see. You can go outside. My best and my favorite is just go outside and explore. So you take the children outside the four walls of the classroom. You take them, you, you explore the sand, different textures of sand and of gravels and of sand, um, and of, of stones, you know, pick them, touch them, feel their weights, throw them, explore with them, kick them and see what's going to happen. Go for water, go and look at the leaves, the different types of leaves, look at them, look at the flowers, say this is a building, this is that, and th because at that time they need to know the environment, you know? So taking that sensory walk with a child once in a, in a while at school will help them a great deal. Okay, and then also try and do group activities so that the children can learn and model behaviors from the ones that are struggling. So um, from the ones that are doing well. So, for example, if we all stand in a circle, we sing some songs, we dance, we jump around, we squat, we do all those things. The ones that are not able to do it can watch the others doing it and self-correct. You know, if even behaviors, it helps a lot with behaviors. If the children that are responding well do well, you see that the teachers will say, let's clap for them. Let's do, let's shine for them, whatever you do. Then the others who are not um, do, uh, portraying good behaviors will now say, I want teacher to clap for me. I want the teacher to give me a hug too. So they learn from these things as well. When you go and buy toys, look for toys that the child can manipulate. Avoid toys that are just, you know, it's, it's big and flashy, but it has just monotonous use. All you do with it is to thank shake it the so entire much. time. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. We really, really love it, and everybody has commended you. We love it. We will do this again. Thank you. Another time we can talk about how we can select um, what to look for when we are selecting toys, which we, you just began. But okay. our time is up. 
And I want to thank you so much and thank our listeners so much. Listeners, you are the center of this because if nobody comes and then then we 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 haven't made an impact. And even beyond the show, keep sharing for us because we really want people to get this information. What are we interested in? We are interested in healthy children because it makes our families happy. We are interested in children who can grow up to lead our country. Some of the problems we have yeah. now are because as children, um, we did not have a lot of um, uh, information. Our parents do not have a lot of information that would have made us better adults, adults that make better choices um, in life. So thank you so much. And thank you.